communications. Uh, we have a resolution to um, read for a long-standing um, employee that's retiring. Bob, do you want to read that? Yes. This is resolution number 172676. The resolution of the Council of the City of Ketchikan, Alaska, recognizing Tom Gaffney for his years of service at the Department of Public Works for the City of Ketchikan and establish an effective date. Whereas Tom Gaffney has been an employee of the City of Ketchikan for 16 years, from September 14, 2000 to August 30, 2017, in the Public Works Department. During those years, he served in the street division as a maintenance technician, was promoted to a senior maintenance technician, and served as the acting street division supervisor for over a year for the Department of Public Works. And whereas Tom Gaffney's ability to help ensure that the street division is operated in a safe and efficient manner has benefited both the city of Ketchikan and citizens of Ketchikan. And whereas Tom Gaffney has always been willing to assist other departments and divisions wherever and whenever needed. And whereas Tom Gaffney clearly demonstrates a strong work ethic day in and day out. And whereas Tom Gaffney has gained the respect and friendship of his fellow employees through his hard work ethic, keen observations, construction, intellect, and skills, all the while maintaining a great sense of humor. And whereas when urgent street division work occurred after hours on weekends and on holidays, Tom Gaffney was there to take the call and do whatever it took to get the job done at all hours of day and night. And whereas Tom Gaffney added a positive and professional image to the street division operation of the Department of Public Works. And whereas Tom Gaffney has represented in the best interests of the citizens of Ketchikan and has been a dedicated and committed public works employee. Now there, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Ketchikan, Alaska, as follows. Section 1. The Council of the City of Ketchikan, Alaska, recognizes and commends Tom Gaffney on his dedicated service and sufficient contributions to the Public Works Street Division and the community. Section 2. The Council of the City of Ketchikan, Alaska, wishes Tom Gaffney success in his future endeavors. Section 3. This resolution is effective immediately upon passage. Pass and approved April 7th, September 17th. Um, signed to Williams. Tom, you here? Come on up. Hey, your chance to say anything you want. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say thank you, and it's it's been my pleasure working for the city. We enjoyed thank having you. you. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, that brings us to persons to be heard, and I'm not sure how to say the first name. Eve. E V. Avila. All right. <laughs> That's supposed to be Ellen Herbley. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm standing in, in her place at this oh, moment. Okay. She's you are sitting not right behind me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. My name is Sam McQuarrie, and I'm here representing the First City Homeless Services, and we are we recognize we're on uh, the agenda 11th in, in the place, place setting. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we're here. There's three of us uh, from the board. Uh, here to answer any questions that you might have about the new program that the First City Homeless Services is uh, wanting to introduce, and that's the uh, overnight warning center. So we'll be here available for questions at the appropriate time. Thank you very much. Agnes. Agnes Moran. Right now I'm wearing my WISH hat. Later on I'll change hats and put on my First City Homeless Services hat. But um, just to kind of give you an update, um, WISH is still interested in CRIF. We're still, you know, working through the numbers to see if it plays out for us. Um, we're going to go out for an RFP next week, most likely, um, to see just to get a, a costing of what we think the renovations will be. In parallel, we're working with the Rasmussen Foundation and their pre-development program to see if that's a, you know, a more viable route for this, to see where it's going. And I appreciate that you guys need to do you know, your due diligence and put the property up for sale tonight if that's what you so decide. But my question for you this evening is, is there a point of no return? I mean, is it as soon as you put it up for sale, it becomes unavailable for as a community asset, or is it only once you've received 
an offer and a, you know a check in the mail. So I'm just curious. We'll take any kind of offer we can get. If you have a proposal, get it to us. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we're. Too. There is no. I mean, we, we're, it, it's our it's our decision no matter what. Okay. So there is no, as far as I know. Yeah. No, we're not we're not that far down the road yet. I need to if cash a check, then probably it's gone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank if you, you have any questions, I'd be glad to address them. No. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ed, where are you? Hey. It's good to see you back. <laughs> okay. This matters about our water here. Okay. I kind of find it a little disturbing because I, the last time you tested our water for heavy metals was in 2011, and the, these three elements that are here do not belong in our water period. It's barium, uh, cesium, and beryllium. These are things of uh, the Paris Climate Agreement for uh, climate change. That's why you see the jets fly and all this crazy stuff out there. If you uh, go to geobioengineering, uh, you can actually find this out, and this is what's ending up in the water because we've done rain samples. And the rain samples come back exactly what the city found in their water. And that's a great concern of mine. Uh, secondly, uh, if you guys want to get rid of your sediments problem in your pipe, build a standpipe while you put off the standpipe, and you get rid of probably 50% of your contaminants. Also, I'd like to ask the city to do an update on the heavy metals testing in the lake and do a sediment test as well if that's possible. And that's about all i got to say about that. And a sediment test? Yes, sir. And we're going to have a special meeting next week when water is going to be one of the issues, so I'll make sure I bring it up. Because I want to see the levels, if they're higher than what they are now. The base, the problem is, if you do a sediment test, you're going to find it's probably going to be about 300 times this, which is way above the safe level. If you talk to a chemist and or a scientist, they'll tell you these three elements I just mentioned to you, the barium, the cadmium, and the cesium, there's no safe levels of this stuff at all. It deposits in your liver, your lungs, and your kidneys. And you can look it up and look up the side effects of these three elements. They don't belong in the water. It is not the city's fault. This is stuff the Paris Climate Agreement is uh, up to. So I'll leave a couple sheets of paper out back for people to okay. grab on the way out or something. Thanks, Ed. All right, thank you, guys. Nancy, you're next. <coughs> Nancy McNulty, Talbot, 11 on Tongas. Good evening, City Council and Mayor. I have a few handouts here I wanted to give you first. for your reconsideration and object to the August 17, 2017 grant of authorization to City Manager Carl Amron to negotiate to amend the Bridgeport Lease Agreements to undertake facility modifications. At the August 17, 2017 Council meeting, I opposed this agenda item and asked that you postpone it at, at until at such time you had a chance to review the Upland study. I just handed each of you my November 17, 2016 letter to City Manager Carl Amron and that I oppose the expansion of Birth 4, Exhibit 1. I sent each of you a copy of this letter when it was written. As you can see in my letter, Talbot's next large project is the float plane dock. Talbot's Corps of Engineers permit for its float plane dock is active until 2022, Exhibit 2. <coughs> I object to any expansion or modification of Birth 4 as it impermissibly infringes on, on the float plane dock and its functionality. There is an agreement between the city, Survey Point Holdings, Ketchikan Dock Company, and Talbots regarding the present Birth 4 dock. I believe there is unnecessary urgency to amend the Birth 4 lease agreements at this time, at a time of year when most property owners adjacent to Birth 4 have a seven day a week schedule with very long hours. There was no notification by the city of Ketchikan on, of this agenda item. If it were built, it will seriously impact several adjacent riparian property owners. I do not believe any adjacent property owner had adequate time to prepare comments and objections for the August 17, 2017 meeting. You can see in my November 17, 2016 letter, I do support the expansion of city owned verse 1, 2, and 3 for the larger ships. 
The present Route 4 was originally built for a cost of approximately $10 million. The current lease payment is approximately $2.8 million per year. The proposed expansion is estimated at $12.5 million. So one might estimate the lease payment to over double to over $6 million per year. If the city makes expansion improvements to city owned births 1, 2, and 3 and not birth 4, the city will not have a large additional lease payment to make on a yearly basis. Again, I would ask that you reconsider the August 17, 2017 grant of authorization to the city manager to negotiate to amend the birth 4 lease agreements for facility modifications. I object to any negotiations by the city manager that will amend the birth 4 lease agreements to undertake facility modifications and expansion of birth 4. Thanks, Nancy. Um, I have nobody else signed up to address the council tonight. Um, is anybody else here that did not sign up? Seeing none, we'll get out of persons to be heard. We'll go back. I forgot we have a public hearing. Um, and we have a public hearing on the protest of Standard Marijuana Cultivation Facility License 12173 Northern Lights Cultivation 2. Is there anybody here to speak to that tonight? See none, we'll come out of the public hearing. We'll go back into agenda. That brings us down to the consent agenda. Um, I have a few things I was going to throw out to you. <coughs> I was going to throw out, um, put 6A1 and 6B1 on the consent. I was going to put um, 7A2, 3, and 5. Um, 7 and um, B2. And then I was going to move, um, I forgot, nine, the resolution for Tom over onto the consent. Move, and, move, yes. Go, go through them one more time. You bet. Um, A1 and B1. Okay. A7, A2, 3, 5, um, 7, and 9. And then B2, that loan application. Any objections to any of them? You can pull anyone you want. Okay. All right, we'll put those on consent. Go ahead. The surplus prop that's credit, right? It's it's in front of I think maybe we should have a little discussion about that. Which one? Surplus property? We can take that off there. Okay, we're going to drop two. Anybody else? Okay, we'll go with the rest of them. Um, do we have a motion to consent? So moved in. Second. Moved in second. Madam Clerk, can you read the items? Approval of minutes of regular city council meeting of August 17th, 2017. A one year renewal of contract number 1529. And that's the 2017 and 2018 Agreement for Lobbying Services with Ray Matuszowski and Associates. The 2017 and 18 Agreement between the City of Ketchikan and the Ketchikan Gateway Borough for payment of funds to the City for library services. <clears throat> Budget transfer for 2017 property and liability insurance premiums. Exempting the procurement of AMR style electric meters from competitive bidding and written quotation requirements of the Keshkai Municipal Code. That's with Cooper Power Systems. Change order number one to contract number 1703, transmission and distribution line maintenance with Northern Power Line Constructors. Change order number one to contract number 1704, utility tree pruning, three dog construction incorporated. Ordinance number 171856, declaring a super vac rescue truck to be surplus city property and authorizing the donation of the vehicle to the Ketchikan Gateway Borough on behalf of the South Tonga service area. That's in second reading. Ordinance number 171851, repealing Ketchikan Municipal Code subsection 11.08.020F, entitled Other Utility Services, and that's in second reading as well. Change order number two final to contract number 1702, Hole in wall floating breakwater replacement with Pool Engineering Incorporated. Award of contract number 1720, 347 Bodden Street contaminated soil cleanup with direct construction. Budget transfer for Bar Harbor North maintenance dredging. 
Resolution number 17-2676, honoring Tom Gaffney for his years of service at the Department of Public Works for the City of Ketchikan. And resolution number 17-2675, submittal of a loan application to the State Department of Environmental Conservation for funding the Schoenbar Road Water Main Replacement Project Phase 1. Thank you very much. Excuse me, Your Honor. You bet. I missed one. Could we um, take 783 out of the wall? 783, why don't we um, we'll approve everything, make a separate motion for that. Thank you. Okay, so let's call the roll on everything except 783. Um, Coos? Yes. Flora? Yes. Sieverton? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Kiefer? Yes. Gage? Yes. Isom? Yes. Williams? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. You shouldn't be listed there. Okay, that passes <laughs> seven to nothing. That brings us to three. Mark, do I make a motion? I'd like to, I would just like to discuss the, the change order to the. Yeah, make the motion, then we can discuss it. Okay. Except if you're going to speak against it. Let me, yeah. let me yeah. We can simply call the roll separately on it. Well, so he yeah, can't speak against it. He, he, he can't make a motion and speak against it. Yeah. Oh. Okay, right, somebody make a motion, please. Your Honor. 783. Go ahead, Judy. I move the City Council approve change order number two, final in the amount of $7,150 to contract number 17-02, hole in the wall floating breakwater replacement between the City of Ketchikan and Pool Engineering, Inc., bringing the total contract amount to $174,706.50. And direct the city manager to execute the change order on behalf of the city council. Second. Mark, you want Steve to explain what's going on? I, I'd like to hear that okay. first, yes, sir. You bet. Steve. Port and Harvest Director Steve Corporon. Um, Got to go back to the start of the history on this one just to make sure everybody understands. We, we were directed to put a short section of breakwater out there, the same as what they had out at the Narrows which is what Pool Engineering had, had put together with Sealy. Um, we brought a proposal to do that, and then we were directed, well, no, we need to put this out for bid. You know, let other people look at it. So we did that. And we got a couple different proposals, one from Western Dock and Bridge, one from Pool. Uh, brought that back. Still couldn't get the decision. So um, because we had two different proposals, and two different sizes, and they were doing the whole breakwater, not just the little part. So we were directed to do it again. So we took both of those designs that were done by the other, by the two competing companies, kind of uh, Mark Hilson, the public works director, who's licensed civil engineer in the state, uh, agreed to be the, the engineer of record, and kind of merged those designs into a generic design. Um, for me. Uh, I'm a civil, but I'm not licensed to practice in this state, and I can't sign the drawings in that. Um, so we went out with that. So that design wasn't the best thing. It was, it was, it was kind of a conglomerate of other things. The, the tricky part, the long section of breakwater had to be built in two sections because we redid all the piles out there when we re rebuilt the harbor last year. So had to be built in two sections, put in between the piles, and then connected. At 110 feet long, with all these huge, you know, six-foot diameter end loader tires, um, that's a lot of mass. And there was a failure a couple weeks after it went into service. And the failure was actually observed by someone that was out there to happen when a large fishing boat that was not in the harbor was, was kind of plowing by uh, through a, you know, a very tight wake up in there. And that's when it finally went. And look, when we Pool went out, got both sections, took them back to Sealy's yard. They hauled them out of the water, uh, took a good look at them, and the half-inch steel had actually uh, torn in a couple of places. So we worked with uh, Pool and Sealy, and Mark and I were out there as well, and we all came to an agreement on what probably a better, healthier design would be for that. Um, they put it back, uh, they redid what they ended up doing was capping off both sections of that long breakwater, putting pad eyes on the end of those two sections, uh, bolting another tire uh, to act as a spacer, and then there's about two lengths of chain in between those pad eyes. So it's a flexible connection now. 
It was like two, two log booms, uh, but with a big tire in between them so they aren't going to work on each other. And that, that should perform very well. Cool told it back out there, put it back in. Um, all they're asking for is basically Sealy's time and materials for redoing this connection and redoing all the work out there. Pool didn't even charge us for going out and getting it, bringing it back, and then taking it all the way back out there and hooking it back up again. So um, that's that's the story. It wasn't it wasn't you know the contractor's design that failed. It was our design under signature, uh, but it was it was kind of a hodgepodge of ideas that were kind of put on paper. So built, to built to our specifications. It was, it was built according with, the, with our drawing. Yeah, and, what we and, asked. But in, and this is something we probably shouldn't even try looking back on it. it when Poole put these together at the, out by the Narrows, um, they didn't bolt anything together like that. All their long sections were, were flexible connections between them. Uh, we just had a special situation, which we went, we hadn't even intended, I hadn't intended initially to even replace the long section, which was a, you know, a bunch of very large timbers all lagged together that have been there for quite a while. Uh, but this, this is the project that just kind of kept giving and giving as, as we, we, we tried <laughs> to, to do what we were being directed to do. Ended up being kind of a, a project by committee, which we had a rule. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, anyway. Any other questions? They aren't even building us for the time to re, to, to go out and, and reset everything. It was just the time and materials for, for redoing an agreed upon better better design. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Call the roll. Isom? Yes. Gage? Yes. Kiefer? Yes. Ziggy? Yes. Flora? Yes. Severton? Yes. 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 Okay, that passes seven to nothing <coughs> brings us down to seven eight one protest and marijuana license application or lights cultivation two. Uh, we have uh, two motions. Pick one. Your Honor, Go ahead. On the move that pursuant to KMC 5.20.050 A8 and B, the City Council protest the application of standard marijuana cultivating facility license number 12173 Northern Lights Cultivation 2 on the basis set forth in the proposal protest attached to the City Clerk's memorandum on August 24, 2017, and to notify the Marijuana Control Board uh, of such protest. Sir. Who did second? Any comments? I'm assuming, I'm, sorry. Go ahead. I'm assuming at this point they haven't satisfied the concerns that were raised at the previous meeting. They have not. Have they responded? I got a phone call yesterday um, and the day before. From There's two, yes. two people involved and um, explained to them the situation and they just simply aren't ready for business. Okay. okay. Anybody yeah. else? Your Honor. Yes. Um, the location is out just north, I think, of Ketchikan Dre there. Um, and it's in closer proximity to uh, residential neighborhoods and stuff. And um, I don't think it fits the character of the area. Uh, one of the things I think that we've always been concerned about is putting this type of operation within close proximities of um, residential dwellings. Um, and within the city, um, the lots are much smaller, so the ability to get separation by space is, is more difficult. So um, I would protest it on the fact also that it, it uh, doesn't make, I think, the characteristics of the area. Anybody else? Call a roll. Flora? Yes. Severton? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Kiefer? Yes. Gage? Yes. Coos? Yes. I see. Yes. Hey, that passes seven to nothing. I bring yeah. Go ahead. Honor, can I speak to that just a little you bit bet. more in regards to looking forward at some of this stuff? Um, and I've, I've talked about having an interruptible power sales agreement in regards to grow operations and, and potentially to look at what those loads may be. In Boulder, Colorado, uh, during the second quarter of 2015, a 5,000 square foot indoor cannabis facility was eating about 29,000 kilowatt hours of electricity monthly and a local household in the county was consuming about 630. They say that uh, uh, an average indoor um, cultivation of four plants uses the same power as about 29 refrigerators. 
And I think that as these come online within the community, we haven't had a problem here lately, but there was a time when we had water shortage, we were up against the spin reserve, which would cause us to go into burning diesel and then everybody would be paying for a diesel surcharge. So we need to look at this type of growth real close and make sure that we're not penalizing the residential customers for maybe overselling or overusing in the commercial fields. And it would be fair to these cultivators that they understand there's an interruptible power sale, so they have other means or alternatives to run their business if we should reduce their power consumption. So it, it's just something in, in regard to the advancing of this, because I think it's still going to grow, whether it be in the city or in the world. Can I make another observation? Yes. Just for your residential issues, um, there's no way for the neighbors are going to smell it. If anyone's ever been around a house that's had more than 10 plants or a large number of plants, that it's going to accumulate the neighborhood. So I would I would almost bet that having it in a residential area, I know most neighbors are not going to want to smell it. Good point. Um, I don't know if any of the neighbors in that area have thought about that. Um, however... <laughs> Good point. Anybody else? We will move on to number four, 784 financial and compliance audit for the year ending December 31, 2017. We have a motion to either extend the contract with um, accountant or go out to bid. Your Honor, Bob? I move the city council authorize the finance director to negotiate a contract with Churcher and Walpool LLC for the financial and compliance audit the city of Ketchikan for the year ending December 31st, 2017 and contract to be submitted to the City Council for formal consideration and approval. Second. Moved and seconded. Anybody want to speak to it? All rolled. Um, let's see. Flora? Yes. Poos? Yes. Severton? Yes. Piper? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Isom? Yes. Gage? Yes. All right. That passes 7 to nothing. Brings us on to 7A. Six resolution submit over loan application last department of environmental conservation for the Schoenbar Road sewer main replacement project phase one and direct city manager withdraw priority request two phase two of the sanitary sewer force main replacement rehabilitation project from further consideration of the national infrastructure program. We have two motions. The honor. Go ahead. I move the city council approve resolution number 17 2674 authorizing submittal of a one million seven hundred ninety-five thousand one hundred ninety-seven loan application to the State of Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation for funding through the Alaska Clean Water Fund for the Schoenbar Road Sewer Main Replacement Project Phase One and establish an effective date. Second. Moved and second. Anybody have any comments? Hopefully, we'll get the loan. Call the roll. Zingy. Yes. Kiefer. Yes. Gage. Yes. Isom. Yes. Coos. Yes. Flora. Yes. Severson. Yes. All right. Second that motion. The Honor. I move the City Council direct the City Manager to withdraw priority request number two, phase two of Sanitary Sewer Force Main uh, Replacement Rehabilitation Project from further consideration of the National Infrastructure Program. Second. Moved and second. Any comments? Call the roll. Kiefer? Yes. Gage? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Severton? Yes. Coos? Yes. Flora? Yes. Ison? Yes. Okay, that passes seven to nothing. That brings us down to, oh, I guess I mean, Eight. no, it's made. Exempting the procurement of professional design services for city hall mechanical heating and cooling system upgrade. Do we have a motion? Your Honor, Go ahead. pursuant to Section 3.12.051C2A of the Ketchikan Municipal Code, I move the City Council exempt the procurement of professional design services for the City Hall Mechanical Heating and Cooling System Upgrade Project from the competitive bid and written quote requirements for the Ketchikan Municipal Code and authorize the City Manager into a professional service agreement with PDC Engineering for the design and it costs not to exceed $59,848 and approved funding from the Building Maintenance Division 217 City Hall HVAC Engineering Design Capital Account. So moved and seconded. Bob, did you want to say anything? Yes. Um, 
we have been down the throat of this <laughs> building a number of different times. This um, is fourth. Yeah, it is probably the fourth. And I am not entirely sure which direction to take, whether we redo the oil boiler, take a look at the inlet air and do all that kind of stuff and try to get this building balanced out. <coughs> or we go as they advised, maybe even with a individual heat pump system that has more local control. What I would like is to make sure that whatever we're gonna do here, we, we finally fix the problem. Um, I'm a little concerned because I think one of the subs in regards to some of this work um, is under a new name and that's controlled contractor and they've been here before and they didn't fix the problem. So I, I don't know what kind of assurances that we're going to get. I, I really like the report. I read through the detailed report in regards um, to the evaluation of our present system and the potential of what we knew. And, and this thing isn't going to, we're not going to be able to get this done in here. There's some fixes that we may be able to do, but uh, long term we're going to have to look at putting the funds available to, to make this thing work. But I, I would like to make sure, and I don't know how to do that because this stuff is, a lot of it's above me in regards to how they calculate this stuff. And there's a lot of balancing and things going on, but through the projects with engineers that supposedly know what we're doing, we've actually reduced the size of the inlet there and we kind of choked ourselves off in some places and we didn't have it. So I am concerned and um, uh, I would like to see this the building um, fixed in regards to both fresh air, cooling, and heating. Good luck. <laughs> well, if the city clerks would quit complaining to open a window, we wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> in, in our lifetimes. In our lifetimes. Yeah. Like I said, I could swear this is the fourth time. Anybody else? Dick. So, I guess the management, how do we handle Bob's concerns? We need to, we need, we need to get it right. We just don't need to keep fixing stuff. Council Member Coos, I'm in a similar position to Council Member Severson, so I'm going to defer to the public works director. Public Works Director Mark Hilson. Um, what I could say is that I hear you loud and clear. Uh, this is the time to fix this once and for all. We took a cautious approach with this in terms of getting the building studied first and evaluate the performance and evaluated the performance of that engineer very carefully. And that's why we're recommending this engineer take on the next step. We don't want to bring another engineer in uh, to relearn the building. And we were very impressed with their their study the first time. So um, the people responsible for that study, we're looking to get them engaged in this design. I think that's the biggest safeguard, number one. Um, number two, as I said, we'll hear you loud and clear. We'll manage it very carefully. Anybody else, Dick? So I'm going to ask you a question, Mark. Do you feel the people you're recommending are qualified and experienced enough to give us the answer? I do, yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Call the roll. Ison? Yes. Coos? Yes. Gage? Yes. Flora? Yes. Kiefer? Yes. Sievertson? Yeah. Yes. And if hasn't said that nothing brings us to 10 specific specifying scope of work for 2018 designated legislative grant Porter Catch Can cruise ship berth. Um, do we have a motion? Yeah, Your Honor. Go ahead. I move the city council and direct the city manager to specify the removal of the rock pinnacle adjacent to berth two as the scope of work for the 2018 designated legislative grant and to respond to the uh, Department of Commerce community economic development consistent with such direction. Second. Who did second? Dick, anything? No, it's really spelled explanatory. We need to get the rock out of there and we're willing to pay for half of it. Okay, call the roll. Gage? Yes. Kiefer? A little like baby Scott. Yeah. <laughs> I can hit the button. <laughs> yes. Zingy? Yes. Sievertson? Yes. Flora? Yes. Coos? Yes. Ison? Yes. Okay, that seven down. It brings us down to number 11, request, request for funding 2017-2008 Overnight Warming Center. 
Your Honor. Go ahead. I move the City Council direct the City Manager to respond and or to take such action regarding the request of First City Homeless Services for funding and support of an overnight warming center as determined appropriate by the City Council. Second. Second. Good and second. Judy? Um, I'd just like to um, thank you folks for doing this. I do have a couple of questions though. Herbally First City Homeless Services, 7, um, 870 Summit Terrace, I live at. And if I may, I would like to introduce uh, Lieutenant Sam Fowler from the Salvation Army. And he is able to um, introduce himself and speak to uh, First City Homeless Services and Salvation Army working together on this project. Great. Welcome. Well, well nice to meet you all. Welcome. Um, so I'm Lieutenant Sam Fowler. My wife and I are in charge of the Salvation Army in Ketchikan, Saxman, and Nakala. And so um, this is, of course, regarding the overnight warming shelter that the Salvation Army um, piloted last uh, winter season. And so it was a pilot program. Uh, we didn't know if it would work or what its effect would be. And so we just kind of went on a one year. Um, let's just see what happens, see if this is worthwhile. And what we discovered is that it was very much so worthwhile. Uh, it just um, alone, it, it preserved human life. There were no loss of life last year um, as a result of people sleeping outside uh, inebriated. Additionally, it um, allowed the, um, the medical center to not be overwhelmed with um, inebriated homeless who had nowhere else to go uh, prior to the warming shelter. There was nowhere else for um, the police department or the fire department to take people. And so it allowed the, uh, the medical center to no longer be overwhelmed with people. So people who really needed help um, were able to get beds when they needed them. And it also allowed um, police and fire a resource, a place where they could take people. Unfortunately, uh, this year, the Salvation Army does not have the funds um, locally or um, within our own organization to fund the program within our own facility. We simply cannot afford it. And our building is not up to code to um, continue to proceed with the program. So we are working um, with, it's a joint project with First City Homeless to uh, continue to provide this service to the community. Um, and so it is definitely a partnership. We are working with them. The Salvation Army is uh, not saying hands off. We still want to be involved. We just simply can't um, foot the bill for it or um, host it in our building. So we're working in partnership with them. And, uh, it's, um, it's really just a preservation of human life issue and ensuring that, that people have a chance to recover from those situations that they're in. Thank you. So, um, well, go ahead, Judy, you're first. Um, I guess I have questions for Evelyn. Yes. So the amount of money that y'all are requesting, is this something that, is this a one-time offer, or is this something that you're going to be coming back for every year, or are you looking for other areas of funding? I guess that's more than one question, but you know where I'm going. I understand. There are two answers to your question. Number one, we would hope that this is our last time to come before you seeking funds. We have applied to, um, we are in the process of applying to Rasmussen, um, Alaska Mental Health, and HUD are the other agencies that would be able to supplement and underwrite this program. The other answer that I want to give you is that there was a delegation of us, and Member Gage was with me last week when we went to Juneau. We met with the Alaska Coalition on Housing and Homelessness Director and the Juneau Directors of Homelessness. This coalition in Juneau has been meeting for 10 years, and generally, correct me, uh, because I might have some of the numbers incorrect. They've been meeting together for 10 years, and for 10 years the city, and pointing fingers at the government, has been saying, we have a problem, we have a problem, and you have to solve this problem, you have to solve this problem. Um, I had never been to the Glory Hole in Juneau before. If you haven't been there, it is right downtown. You cannot go anywhere in Juneau without men or women on the sidewalk loitering because they have been 86 or they are not welcome in other places. 
So it was just two years ago that the city government said, we are invested in this situation. We are monetarily going to invest in the alleviation of homelessness in Juno. And they, with the um, Juno, um, no, 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 Community Foundation, give uh, the Alaska Coalition, on, the Juno Coalition on Housing and Homelessness, eight hundred thousand dollars a year. The government said, "We're giving you this money. You invest it in taking." men and women who are stranded on the streets and finding housing and shelter for them. So the city government has now committed itself annually to participate in addressing homelessness in their community. That to say, I can't guarantee you that this is the last time I'm going to be standing before you because hopefully at some point in time, our city leadership will be able to say there are men and women in our community facing homelessness. What you have in front of you, I would like to address your packets. Last year when Agnes, Sam, and I were here, Agnes said uh, that we would come back to you with numbers and you will find within, hidden within your packet the statistics that were garnered from the night warming center at the Salvation Army. You can see every single day people register. You can see how many people registered, and if you know people's initials, you can figure out who it is. But I guarantee you that every single one of those people came to the warming center because they did not want to be on the street. Not every single one of the men and women who came to the warming center were an alcoholic. Not every one of them is addicted to alcohol. Some were on the streets by virtue of being homeless for the various reasons that bring people to the streets. I can understand the sentiments of many people that say it's their problem, they did it, they're addicted, it's not my problem. I understand that. But I also understand the letter that I gave you from the hospital if I may, I gave you now in your earlier this evening a packet of new letters, most from the chief of police, from the supervisor at the prison, uh, from the museum, speaking directly about their concerns about where the men and women are sleeping and the concerns that they have from Parnassus. But you will note that if you do the math from the hospital's letter, it says, prior to last year, it's in the middle of the second paragraph, it was not uncommon for three, four, or five of these individuals to be brought to the emergency department each night. Once, the, once in the emergency department, they took up stretchers that would have reserved for true emergency medical needs. Often our medical patients have to wait for us to clear another room in order to be seen while these individuals are simply sleeping off their inebriation, drying, or warming up. I used to be the supervisor of an emergency room for seven years in Nampa, Idaho. I have had personal experience with inebriated people coming into an emergency room and sleeping it off. So let us do some math. Three, four, or five people. Let's do the low ball. One person comes in to the emergency room just to sleep it off. Shall we say $1,000? They come into the emergency room. Can you go to the emergency room for $1,000? Let us hope you could. Not likely. So three people come, that's $3,000 a night, times seven, that's $21,000 a week. In the course of six months, you've just spent over $500,000. That's what it costs just in the emergency room, let alone the police, as Chief White in his letter 
tells you the burden of tending and babysitting and transporting men and women is reduced because they bring them to the overnight warming center. They do a triage. This person is not combative. This person is not a harm to himself or others. And last year they brought them to the, emer to the overnight warming center. The ambulance will bring people who don't need to be transported to the hospital. When they are done drying out at the hospital, they bring them to the overnight warming center. So the multifaceted impact upon our city by an overnight warming center for inebriates, and this is the sad part of our conversation because we are honing in and focusing on only one segment of the people who use our overnight warming center. I cannot say it enough. Not everyone who comes to the day shelter is an alcoholic. Not everyone who comes to the night shelter is going to be an alcoholic. There are homeless people by virtue of the fact that life has dealt them that card. And so Park Avenue Temporary Home opens its door at 5 o'clock. If they're full, they turn people away. So there are people who cannot go to PATH because it's full. We have men and women who come to Park Avenue Temporary Home who will blow in a respirator, and if they have had a beer, they have alcohol on their breath, they can't stay. Are they an inebriate? Maybe not. Maybe they just had a beer. So yes, alcohol is involved for why people are on the street at night, but it is not the only reason. And so when we make our judgments and when we make our decisions, we have to be more broad spectrum than to think, I don't want to help this group of people continue by enabling them in their condition. An addict is an addict, whether it be drugs or whether it be TV or whether it be pornography, or whether it be eating. We all have addictions that are unsavory. This one just seems to be more unsavory because these men and women, we see them in a public place. Now, is this money um, going to go to the Salvation Army? How is it going to be used? Now, you, they said they needed some work down there. Are we talking about utilizing this for some of the things that they're inefficient on? No. So um, this will just be to run the facility? This will be to, if you look at the cost uh, I have that you have in the packet, uh, uh, we have given you a detailed project plan and the cost estimates. The proposal. Most of those are, though, for staff. It's staff. Right. So, so you got three weeks, roughly. Um, do you know where it's going to be? Yes. Okay. Where is it going to be? Um, wait a minute. I answered too soon. <laughs> In here, I know where it's going to be. Right. On paper, I cannot tell you where it's going to be. So the, reason, the, re the reason I'm saying that is because... Um, we interviewed with a place last night and we received our no this afternoon. So we are in the process of speaking with our second op opportunity and and I believe the second opportunity will say yes. So it's not going to be at the Salvation Army? It will not be at the Salvation Army. But the place that we are now looking at, the fire marshal has been here. We pulled the fire marshal and the fire chief's letter of of recommendation from the packet because they were both addressing place A. As soon as place B says yes, then the fire marshal and the police chief and the fire chief will write a letter of recommendation that they have invest that they have indeed walked through the place and agree on the place. The rent is the same and all of the expenses ultimately might be less. It's gonna be downtown? Yes. Anybody else have any questions? Bob? Then generally. So the goal is um, 
We will have four employees. We will strive to have a male and a female. We have three people who have agreed to be employees at this point in time. That was one of the issues that we had last year at Salvation Army. It was all done by um, volunteers, and some of those volunteers were volunteering mainly for um, because they were homeless. And um, so we did not have trained staff. This year we will have trained staff and approved staff and, and um, we'll be making changes. One of the most important factors that will happen also is the doors will be closed for walk-ins as of 10 o'clock. Um, you can't be downtown having a good time and then think, oh, it's time to go to bed now and walk in. You cannot. So if you are downtown and you want to use the shelter, the doors lock to you at 10 o'clock and you cannot walk in. Police can bring you, emergency services can bring you, WISH can refer people to you, but uh, author people of authority within our community can call and say, will you let so-and-so in? And we would, but as a free will walk-in, um, no, that will not. If you want to go out and have a smoke, then you're out for the rest of the night. Uh, there are re requirements that we're going to place upon the management and the um, staff thing for this. I can tell you that um, Agnes Moran, Sam McCreary, and myself have put hours into preparations and planning of this. And if anything else, I would hope that our goodwill and our reputation amongst you would be evidence of our um, commitment and our regard for our city and the residents of our city. Gentlemen, you had a question? Hi. I didn't really have a question. I just wanted to add that the wealth of information that we got in Juno on what they're doing across the board there, um, it was a two-way street. We actually gave them information because they're working on a warming shelter. Um, and they just opened their Housing First project. But um, again, I will just reiterate what um, Evelyn said is that this will cut our costs in the emergency room and um, inundating the emergency staff, let alone our police department and our fire department. Okay. And it also will, I would hope, have a, we'll have another year where we're not uh, finding bodies or not finding people. Dave? No, I've got the shoes. Yeah. Thought? Yeah. I gave this a great deal of thought, and there's no doubt about your and other people's dedication to the, the issues in this community. And, Thank you. And I certainly appreciate that. Um, but as a council member, I'm dealing with other people's money. I see families out there, four or five people to both parents are working, they're trying to get their kids through school, and they're paying their taxes, they're paying their utility bills, struggling to make ends meet, and then we're turning around and taking those funds and putting it into a program that we'd hope to have uh, more benefit, because if you, if you just enable, if you just bring them in without any programs to, to help, to turn them around, to give them hope, um, I don't know if we're the situation or making it worse um, because it can't be just housing them it has to be something to um, to try to help them through the situation that they're in whatever it may be um, and I don't think it's uh, the city's I guess position to fund all of this we definitely want to be a partner okay? but we don't have the resources to run other people's programs. We're going to be talking rate structures and taxes and just to run the operations that we run. Uh, so I am concerned in regards to how this thing is going to be financed and if there is a plan in place so it can become somewhat self-sustainable. I'm not saying that it's going to probably meet all its needs, but it has to do better. An $80,000 ask is probably more than, willing, than what I'm uh, willing to consider. I do want to start with something, and I know that we had some money left over or was brought back in that I would definitely move forward, and, and if other council members want to add to that, I would listen to those arguments. 
because it is a community problem, the hospital needs to be a part of this funding source because they're the ones that are taking a financial hit, which comes back to us in the way of, of health care costs. And the state of Alaska has got to be a partner because um, they don't want to take people unnecessarily at the correction center if they're not criminals or anything like that. So it saves them money also, but there should be buy-in for more. The borough should be part of this. I mean, there's a lot of organizations that should come to the table and, and, and help through this. So I think we're willing to be a partner, but I don't know that we're the whole, the whole answer. And, and I'm sorry, go ahead. And, and may I address what you're saying? This is one of the uh, ideal segues that uh, I believe we're discussing. Um, we're talking about night shelter. We're talking about a place for people to sleep. Mm -hmm. First City Homeless Services has a place for people to be during the day. So during the day, we will be working with seeing walking side by side with probably all of the 12 to 15 people that will utilize the overnight warming center. What I can tell you as of today, three of the people that we all know in this room are now at Gateway receiving treatment. Now, to me, that's a big deal because the day shelter has been open for eight years these three individuals have been at the day shelter every day for three year, for eight years. And it's just this year that they became empowered and courageous enough to face their addictions. But it was eight years. I think I you can, have a question? Are you through? No, I just wanted, what, all, all I wanted to do is, is continue to... Um, Member Sivitson to, to continue to say, as a program of First City Homeless Services, it, it just means that we receive funding for the day shelter from the state of Alaska. We receive funding from the borough for the day shelter. What we are in the process of doing at First City Homeless Services is expanding the services that we offer but also recognizing that we receive funding from many agencies in support of what we're doing already. This new program, yes, we've come to the city as the first buy-in, but as the first buy-in, we're able to now say to these other entities and agencies, the city has bought into this, just like the Juno city government has bought into it. We are committed to it. Now we can say to all these different agencies, the city of Ketchikan initiated the overnight warming center. And the way the city of Ketchikan initiated the need for the overnight warming center was last October when the city called together this chronic inebriate problem with benches. That was a tremendous step for the city because it was the first step that said we recognize that we as a city need to address this, not just you nice people who have big hearts. We as a city now are saying this is a matter of concern for our city government and our entire community, and we want you the city manager to call all of these people together and start a conversation as to how we can address what is happening in our city. That was successfully done out of a meeting that was called by the city. So thank you for calling it. Thank you for bringing it to a head. And as a result of that meeting, we took the initiative to start addressing some of what was viewed as a problem, and that is the behavior of men and women who have to sleep on the benches at night because they have no place else to go. So our response of an overnight warming center is an answer to your call to action. Thank you. Nick? Uh, yeah, I just... I wanted to say I want to thank you folks for 
what you've done, what you're doing, passion you've got, and a plan that seems to be fairly well laid out. And then with that said, though, I'm concerned that we may be trying to get the city into funding this whole thing, and if that's the case, then I've got an issue. I think I want to be a partner. To what degree, that is something that the whole council is going to have to determine. Uh, but I guess I want to encourage us to move forward, but whether it's for the full $80,000 this year or whether you've gotten other sources that will help, I, I don't know right now because this is the first time we've seen this. But keep moving and we'll see where we get. But we need to be with you, and I think we are with you, but to what degree, that's the issue. Again, Lee, uh -huh. then Judy, and then Mark. So just to speak to, uh, with everybody, is, um, there's – there's actually a, a study that proves that when you give people shelter and you give them food and you give them um, a warm place, they, it may take eight years for some people to get um, uh, to seek other treatments or other um, avenues. But it has been um, actually proven that when they're not worried about where they're sleeping, that a lot of times their drinking or use will drop. And again, um, not everyone's not everyone's inebriate. One, some of the things that were brought up was that there are a lot of people with low income, um, people with different um, disabilities that are uh, um, using the day shelter and the night shelter or warm shelter. There's um, variable degrees of. Uh, I've seen several people myself that have successfully um, um, after having the support of the shelters um, seek treatment and are doing well. The, um, and a lot of the programs at Gateway, for example. The, um, the other thing is, is that um, one of the things we learned in Juno was that um, with the assistant, with the spy-in of the city um, and the borough there, which is all one, they, um, there's the state is pushing for a, a database that they will have. We're going to be looking at in a couple weeks. Um, that they'll be the state of Alaska is uh, bringing down somebody to go over this to see what our numbers are, um, which is fairly close to what Juno's homeless problem is. Sitka, Petersburg are all um, on getting online on this. Um, I think it's important that um, in order for that the funding sources that the state is going to be having, and there's a, a conference in Fairbanks coming up in a, in a month, the, um, the need of the communities, us, the city, and our community members to buy in and understand that this is, there's more to it than just, as she said, inebriates. Okay. So, just so I'm clear, I think I am. So you're you're looking for eighty thousand dollars to run this for this season, correct? Yes. So, I mean, I know it looks like a big number, but I think that when you look at what it's what we're paying for EMS service and the police department, um, I know some business owners who've talked to me about people who sleep in their doorways and cause damage and. I mean, we're going to pay now and know that people are safe and know that the folks that are handling them are trained um, or pay later. I mean, we're going to pay in overtime costs because we're going to have to call out more cops if they're going to pick people up. We're going to be dealing with, you know, the, the fire folks and the EMS people. So to me, I think, do I like the number? Of course not. Nobody likes the number, but it's... I think that at the end of the day, we really have to look as a community on who we're going to take care of and how we're going to do it and look at that. I might agree with you, Judy. Um, Mark, Mark has it. Oh, sorry, Mark. <laughs> you folks want to have this going in about three weeks, right? That would be our ideal. Okay. Uh, we, we are specific also. Agnes wants to be able to talk about the, the grants that we've applied for to let you know that we're not just coming to you. We're being due diligent. Uh, 
Ideally, we're saying October 1. If it has to be later than October 1, we will accept that and through March 31. And the reason we have chosen those dates is because, and we can show you on our papers and our statistics, that those are residents between October 1 and May 31. We're not interested in offering shelter and housing to the transient summer population. By October 1, that population has departed. And if they haven't departed, it's because they don't have any money to depart. So the shelter isn't keeping them here. The shelter is just keeping them out of trouble, maybe, for some of those people. But we want to stick to those six months. If we have to open later than October 1, then this is what we do. Last year, we, uh, after the October meeting uh, called by the city, we opened with Salvation Army on November 26 or 28, 28, the 18th, November something. So we would have. The other point I wanted to make to you um, and before I turn it over to Agnes, is we were also told by the Amer um, emergency department that uh, they had a very difficult time the month of April um, after we closed on March 31 with the influx of sick men and women, not just inebriated, but actually men and women who live on the street who came to the emergency room because they were ill, hadn't been ill all winter, but they are now ill. There are any number of arguments pro and con. I absolutely agree with you. And it's the matter of deciding, like Judy was saying, how do you address the needs of your community and this is one of the means by which Ketchikan can address the needs of some of the members of its community. They don't have money to rent a house, and many of them are not employable. I think Council Member Sieverton makes an excellent point about participation from other entities. I think given the timeline, I don't see how that's viable. If we choose to go forward with this, there's nothing that precludes us from asking the borough, the state, the hospital to be participants after the fact, so to speak. I also agree that the referral to services should be an essential portion of this. Um, but when we look at grants in general, I was actually pretty surprised when I was first appointed to the council. You look at the, the annual list. I can't think of any grants that are more important to the community than the ones that are humanitarian based. And yet, they seem to be at the bottom of the list getting the least amount of money. So I'm not sure how we fund this, if this is a loan or if we forward fund this from next year's total grant program and then figure out how to help the other grant recipients next year at budget time. But this does seem like a relative bargain to the community given the benefit. Well, I think the... Uh I don't mind starting with the 80, and then as they add people involved um, from the hospital, whoever, we can reduce our uh, amount as the years go on. The, um, I don't want us to become, you know, the sole funder of this. Um, it's a great thing that I mean, it helps. Um, you know, everybody said the police, the fire, the jail, the hospital, and everything. So I don't mind giving it a start at their new location, and hopefully, then Agnes is working to get other uh, people involved, and I think there will be other people involved. That, uh, can take um, a chunk of this too, so it's not just in the lap of the city. Um, somebody else had a question, Dave? Well, not a question, just pro probably a statement. Go ahead. Um, we're not going to solve the problem of homelessness in Ketchikan with $80,000. So I think we're looking at the forest for the trees here. What we can do is solve a portion of it or at least deal with a portion of it. And I think if we're worried about whether we spend 40000 or 50000 or 60000 you know, it, I, I'm not going to get caught again as I once was years ago by saying that's not a, a large amount of money because the end of the day news runs an editorial saying, Mr. Kiger, it's a large amount of money. <laughs> I agree with that. But so much of what we do at this table, so much of the money that we spend, so much of the millions and millions of dollars, where does it go? 
You know, if we keep these people off the street, if we keep a couple of them alive this winter, that's not wasting money. And I'm a taxpayer. And I have no problem with my money. And actually, that's where it's going to come from. There was already $80,000 in the budget this year that the staff had put in for something to the, around the, this. And that's still there. We didn't take it out. We just, we just chose not, not, not to use it for grants. So, yeah, do I, do I th going forward, do I want to see other, other groups involved in this process? Absolutely. But this is something we can do now. And we kind of need to do it now. We don't have time to rep the flag and say, who else wants to jump on board? We need to get it going, then get, get the other folks involved. But, but I do agree with the point that we don't want this to be a situation where 10 years from now we're still funding 100% of the warming shelter. Do we have a motion for a dollar amount? Bob? Thank you. Yeah, um, a couple of things in regards to funding. Um, we have, what, somewhere between nine and ten thousand dollars in the community grant funding that was turned back to us. Is that correct? Just under ten thousand. Just under ten thousand. So that would be a portion of the funding for this particular operation, um, and then so the the rest of it would co come from the general fund, I would imagine, because we don't have because we turn the money back to the general fund. All right. We had appropriated seventy-five thousand. There's a proposed appropriation in the 2017 budget, which the council returned to reserves. It was treated as a community grant, so half came from KPU, half came from general government, divided by the three uh, sales tax funds. And if the council were to elect to fund the full amount, that's what I would bring back. Funded that way at least for the first time and see where we are in 12 months. So, the other thing is, we still don't have a place. So, these funds wouldn't be necessary until such time as they actually have a facility that they can occupy. I'm willing to, be, I think, put up the 10 grand because you can want to train somebody and do this kind of stuff. But, uh, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep her out of trouble right now, and I'm okay, <laughs> going to push her off. Because <laughs> I, I know in her heart she wants to tell you what she wants to tell you, but I know it's not a good idea at this point in time. <laughs> so um, part of the reason we're coming to you right now for the full amount is because we got a lot, late start on that with the change in command at the Salvation Army, and it wasn't resolved until late that the facility wasn't correct. We got kind of a late start. Um, we did apply for, we did investigate some HUD funding, um, and the HUD funding that was up for the cycle that it was resolved here in September was more for permanent housing. The HUD funding that comes up for um, temporary or street outreach, which is the program that this would apply for, opens in February. Um, one of the key aspects of applying for that funding is in the database, you'll see this AKHMIS database. Um, you need to participate in that to get bonus points to move yourself up the ladder for the HUD funding. So we kind of we need to do that. Um, fortunately, when we opened the when they opened the um, the day shelter, the database form that they were using to intake people is very similar to what this AKHMIS database is looking for, which is the form that we handed over and used in the Salvation Army. So we do have a leg up there. Um, we've also approached the Alaska Mental Health Trust, and we've done a letter of intent to them to, you know, to assist us um, with this project. We did not get rejected out of turn. Um, we're into the next cycle where they're going to tell us, you know, whether or not we can go forward with the full grant proposal. The Alaska Mental Health Trust will be here at the end of the month, and when we were in Juneau, I was up there for some other business with my other hat on. Um, but I sat in on a few, one of the meetings, and one of the mental health trust people told me that at that meeting to go to the public forum and give some comments and, you know, talk it up. And she thought that there was a pretty good chance that they would consider us. So there's no guarantees there. As for the hospital, um, you can see from their letter that they are supportive of it. We have not directly gone to them yet because we all. You know, we just kind of ran out of time. We've been working pretty hard at putting this together. Um, some of us actually have jobs now. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I had that error in judgment. But, um, and 
there's a lot of work that has gone into this. The one thing I want you to notice about this proposal is there really is no overhead. I mean, we're not asking you to fund, you know, management at this stage. We're not asking you to look at, you know, funding us to put this proposal together. You know, we've been working this for eight years before we finally came to the stage here. You know, we've done this out of our own pockets and out of our own time. So what you're funding here is you're funding the program. You're funding the people in the room on the floor. Going forward again for some of the sustainability stuff, we're hoping to get into the HUD program. We will approach the hospital. We're working on the mental health trust. There is um, a state program that we're investigating, but again, those, unfortunately, the timing for the opening of those grants isn't until, you know, later on in the year. The other thing that First City Homeless Services has done, because we do have a strong commitment to resolving this problem, not only for the short term, but for the long term, is we have a VISTA coming on board in January. And her task is to work on homeless issues in Ketchikan. County. That's her task. Your task is to look at what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, take a look at some of these other options that are out there, and just work on putting together something that is um, feasible, sustainable, and reflects what this community needs, not just what the latest trend is out, you know, in you know, in the grants. And so we have, we are working this, um, unfortunately, with a short time frame. And with the timing of um, our requests, we're not in the right grant cycles. And it really is about best practices that what we got out of that whole. So there's a lot more coming up. Uh, Mr. Flora uh, was working on our 1998 Stratus today and was asking Terry questions about this overnight warming center and as Terry was so judiciously being a husband of 40 years, said, well, ask my wife. So, Mr. Floor, I can tell you about referrals. He's a good um, husband. <laughs> He's a smart husband. But do we have, do we have any direction from the council here? We need to make some decisions here. Jeff, really? Can I amend the motion yes. to fully fund it this year, the overnight warming center? Is there a motion? There is. No yeah, motion. Second. There's, there's, there's this is a amendment motion to the motion. To give a direction. Okay, we have a motion on there to fully fund it at eighty thousand. Um, one time, yeah, one, one time funding. They they'll reapply yes. under the community aging grant next year with the, with the program. Yes, on the same cycle with everybody else. All right. Color roll. Yes. Flora? Yes. Sievertson? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Kiefer? Yes. Gage? Yes. Isom? Yes. Okay, that passes seven to nothing. Thank you, everybody. I think it's a great program. Um, that brings us down to vouchers. Kitchen Daily News, $2,571.07. Did I? No, we got oh, we didn't do B1 yet? Uh, purchase of two electric division trucks. pickup trucks in lieu of the underground cable puller. Do we have a motion? Your Honor, go ahead. I move the City Council authorize the Electric Division to solicit competitive bids for the purchase of two pickup trucks in lieu of the budgeted underground cable puller as detailed in the Electric Division's Operations Manager's Report dated August 24th, 2017. Second. Anybody have any comments? Bob? You know, I've seen this in the budget and I've seen it in these reports here. One of the key words they use is corrosion. Mark, can you tell me how badly these pickups are corroded? To what extent? Electric operations, <clears throat> excuse me, electric operations manager Mark Adams. Um, truck four or five, for instance, the undercarriage under the under the uh, bed has been welded a couple times, so the frame itself is starting to rot. Um, it's gotten to the point where I mean we can keep it going for a you know a couple more years, but looking at the funding we're just not quite there we're really to justify the underground cable puller so we looked at what vehicles we have and these two are recommended by our fleet mechanics um, body wise they're not too bad four or five in particular looks pretty good on the on the outside but it's really the the frame and the chassis um, they're not you know, 
we've had some vehicles where the, the rear end is really almost ready to fall out. And they're not to that point, but they're already starting to have to, like I, like I said, have to do welding and, and, and whatnot on the, on the frame. So what brings the corrosion? Are we launching boats with these things and not cleaning them afterwards? Do you nope. have any idea? No, five, five, I don't think four, I don't believe four or five has really been used for launching boats. Five, two might have been a, hand, a handful of times. Um, just the just the wear and tear. Some of these trucks, actually, these, uh, if I remember right, these, this vintage of the Chevy pickups uh, had have had some corrosion issues. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is attached to Bailey, right? They're both assigned to the to the Bailey maintenance, which also includes the fleet. So four five is the is the kind of the fleet mechanic truck. It has an air compressor and and whatnot in the back. Five two is a pickup that is assigned to the really the powerhouse mechanic side. I mean they're interchangeable within the group, but they're. So how many pickups do, or how many trucks do I guess do we have at Bailey assigned to Bailey? We have, have. I was just looking at the numbers. I want to say we might have six or so, and we're looking we're looking at what we can do to re reduce our overall fleet. Actually, um, we've been looking at the the maintenance burden on that the fleet side has um, with the couple guys that we have. Since we added a powerhouse, the mechanics are getting stretched more and more with the same uh, with with the existing workload plus the powerhouse and an aging uh, vehicle fleet. So we're looking where we can. Uh, get some newer vehicles, and then we're also looking at what vehicles we can get rid of, um, and then just flat out not replace to start bringing that number down. I think we might be able to do two or three in 2018. You'll see when you guys get your budget packets in a while. We, we're starting to look that direction where we can bring that number down. So, do we ask for any additional undercoating or something? Because it sounds like corrosion is, is our major issue. Uh, we don't wear the trucks out because you get one with 55,000. Right. Yeah, that's what we were seeing with some of actually some of the. Uh, the van that I referenced that had the rear end that was falling apart was about that same vintage. Um, we have, in some cases, particularly the big trucks, we uh, like the the Digger Derricks and the bucket trucks. We have been requiring undercoating on the frames, and we can look at doing that on the on the on the frames for the smaller rigs too to extend that longevity. Right, because ultimately, it's it's usually not a mechanical issue. It's usually usually the structural issue and just getting eaten up. So we can look at doing something like that. I would suggest that if we, and I don't know if it takes extra money in the budget or not. That we, we look at <coughs> undercoating those so that we can increase the longevity of them. Because if we're not wearing them out and we're replacing them because they're rotting away, uh, anything we can do to prevent that right. early on is probably a, a good plan. Yeah, we can do that. Um, and the other thing is, is um, is the size of the vehicle appropriate? I don't know. I mean, you guys yeah, three quarter, three quarter ton pickup for for these purposes is fine. Some of the, for the most part, three quarter ton. Sometimes we get into some one tons. Okay. Um, and, and a few of the trucks are. 450 or 550 class, but for these trucks, the three-quarter tons are fine. So are we going to come back later and have to look at a tugger? Excuse me? Are you going to have to look at that underground puller? We're going to play by ear. We're not looking at it for next year's budget right now. Um, you know, the thinking was with the addition of the underground 34.5 up on 3rd Avenue and the underground transmission out on Powerhouse Road, some of these longer runs, and the downtown is all mostly underground, too, that we're probably getting to that point, but... All of those were installed without the actual underground cable puller. We just we're, we're kind of on that cusp, but we're really not there yet to, to justify it. And even at that, we were looking at buying a used one. Some of the newer newer underground cable pullers are just well. And again, my my concern is you get a specialized piece of equipment and you use it for this project that sits in the exactly. yard for two years, three yeah, years. That's it. Yeah. Is, do we have the option of rent or lease? We could always rent one. They have. Uh, Fleets down south that have cable pullers and trucks and whatnot that are available. If, if we I got if we got a project that we were going to do, we needed one. We could pick one up for that yeah, particular I project. I think that's probably because a lot of times, and I've seen it in other departments, you buy a specialized piece of equipment, use it for a project. This would sit. Yeah, the cable puller would sit quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. yeah. So I think leasing that, and you always you always have to have a nice one that works. If we need, but you know, the line trucks have capstans. Yeah. And so that's that's what we were able to pull in. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Call the roll, please. Isom. Yes. Gage. Yes. Kiefer. Yes. C. Yes. Severson. Yes. Flora. Yes. Coos. Okay. Yeah. Pass seven nothing. That brings us vouchers. Daily news twenty five hundred seventy one dollars and seven cents. Do we have a motion? Yeah, all right. I move. Second. Move in second. Call the roll. Gage. Sharon. Ison. Yes. 
Kiefer? Absolutely. Severson? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Coos? Yes. Flora? Yes. That past seven nothing. That brings us manager's report. Carl, do you have anything? Just a couple, Mr. Mayor. Um, in your packet, you know, on the manager's report, you know, want a request for a special meeting next week. We're suggesting either the 13th or the 14th. Is that Thursday in any way, shape, or form? Either Wednesday or Thursday. Which one do you guys prefer? Thursday. 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 Which one do you like? Thursday. 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 Okay. Thursday will be, Carl. <laughs> I'm going to try to have that packet out to you by closing the list. Okay. Next, Carl. And just on that, would that be a work session? Are you going to try to manufacture something, or is that just a general outlay first? I, I think it can just be done in regular session, given that we're limiting the topics to those three items. So, thank you. Um, Mayor Williams, I spent about 45 minutes yesterday up on Water Street Trestle Number Two with an assistant uh, public works director, Seth. It's an impressive project that's kind of hidden from view from the public. I talked to Seth. If any of you are interested in going up there and seeing what, what's happening, he would be more than happy to take you out for a tour. And I think you'd be very, very impressed and pleased with what you see that Dawson and the state are, are doing up there. So I, I'd recommend that highly. I will not be here for the next meeting. I will be up in Haynes with Member Severson at the Southeast Conference. Mr. Martin will be filling in for me. And relative to the executive sessions tonight, we only need to do one. Uh, that's 15A3 for PSEA. So let's see. Eight. Okay. Three. Okay. Three. Okay. Um, city Clerk's five. Uh, just one question, Your Honor. I need to know from the council if anybody else who has non not contacted me the deputy as to whether they're going to go to the AML conference? Let him know as soon as possible. Yes, because if we have one more, then we need to reschedule our council meeting. Okay. I will be back. Hmm? I will be back for the council meeting. Okay. I believe. <laughs> Everything's live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> City attorney's file. I think you are. Future agenda items. I brought up the fact about how we're going to deal with these um, go operations and their consumption of power and where that's going to put us. Um, we have long years on water where it's not going to be an issue, but if we get cold weather and low inflows, it may become an issue. So I'd like to at least start looking at that and put it someplace out in the future where we can look at um, an interruptible power sales agreement with uh, individual customers that are large users. Carl, you got that? Already had it down from the earlier discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. All right, Mayor and Council comments. Dick? Uh, none, Your Honor. Judy? Um, I just want to say that how fortunate are we as a community that three citizens who see a problem take it upon themselves to work, put in a lot of hours, bring us a proposal. They weren't paid to do it. They didn't ask money to research it. They just did it on their own time. Um, and I really want to thank um, Evelyn Herbley, Sam McQuarrie, um, and Agnes Moran, who basically spearheaded this and, and brought it together for us. I think we're, we're pretty lucky to have it. Very good. Jelly? Um, I'm going to add to that. The, um, the meeting in Juneau brought up a lot of things that, um, and I don't know if this is something that we can look into for uh, funding uh, projects of this nature in the future what Juno actually had where they were putting 1% of um, revenue or tax revenue into a, a separate and then had um, people vote and every three years the funding went into a specific project so they actually had um, that was one of the suggestions the um, their housing first project opens and that was a project that their whole community came together and worked on and this is a project for their highest risk um, individuals of like 35 um, small uh, apartments uh, Clinkett housing Clinkett Haida housing um, program donated the land um, and it's out there by the uh, Costco the um, but by going through basically putting all these nonprofits in the same room like we did in the 
uh, a couple months ago, they came up with this and they've been working on it. And so they gave us some really good essential plans. They also showed us that there is a large movement throughout the state of Alaska to uh, coordinate the data of how many homeless. And um, due to the um, cost of living, as we all were, we've all talked about the the right, you know, constantly having to raise the cost of utilities and taxes and things like that. Um, there's also um, they're they're looking into um, cost efficient housing um, for those that are you know not making enough. Um, Anchorage is having an issue. Where not, it's not just homeless people that are going to food banks. It's people who have regular, forty-hour-a-week jobs, two people working, and they're not able to afford food because they're paying. So these are things that we probably need to um, look towards. Um, I think the warming shelter is the first step. There, I think, is a huge. There's a lot more going on. Once they start putting those that data into the HM uh, program, um, we will no longer look like the community that only has 10 homeless people, according to the federal database, which kind of was a shocker to me. I was like, and our numbers are very similar to Juno's, and we have a third of the population um, based on the numbers that um, Evelyn had and uh, um, Agnes and the path. Um, we. We're right up there with um, what Juno's um, seen. So, thank you, mm -hmm. Chili. Nothing, Bob. Well, if you ever spend a winter in Juno, you know why we have more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I go along with what Judy had said about there's countless number of volunteers in this town that do tireless work. Um, and actually, I think all Judy has to do is look in the mirror in the morning and she'll see one of them. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Mark? Nothing, Your Honor. Dave? Um, just one, 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 one brief item uh, for the, for the um, city manager. Uh, it would appear that the, uh, um, the uh, Postal Service has vacated their use of the Centennial thing, so we can probably take down the, the no parking signs because they haven't been there for about a month. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, Dave? No, it's over. Summer's over for them. Summer's over. It, it was over in uh, two weeks after this summer. That's, that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. All right. I just um, my prayers are answered. I'm on chemo. I feel good, and I made it to the meeting because I miss you guys. I'm very, <laughs> very happy for that. Um, thanks for putting up with me. Um, Layla from the KRB just texted me and said that. Um, Dick, Dave, and Mark have a candidates forum seven o'clock Thursday. That you must have forgot about. Do <laughs> you want to switch the meeting to Wednesday? No. No. Okay, Thursday it is. It's something else. I'll let her know. And then I have I got some emails. I mean, a text is that um, our live streaming was having some problems, so I don't know what to do there. And that's um, all I have. We have an executive session on. Um, <laughs> number, three. <laughs> number three, do you have a motion? Yeah. I move the city council to declare that consistent with the city manager's memorandum dated August 21st, 2015. It is in the best interest of the city to discuss negotiations regarding a collective bargaining agreement between the city of Ketchikan and the Public Safety Employees Association. In executive session, according to we have the findings of the city council, go into executive session in accordance with KMC. 2.04.025A1 and B2 and AS 44.62.310C1 and 3 to discuss negotiations and auxiliary items described in the city manager's memorandum dated August 21st, 2017, which matters include the need to discuss subjects, the knowledge of which would have an adverse impact upon the finances of the city and upon the city's ability to negotiate favorable labor stuff. Who did second? Call the roll, please. Coos? Yes. Flora? Yes. Sieverton? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Piper? <laughs> yes. Gage? Of course. I see. Yes. Okay, let's adjourn out this meeting and go into the other room. You know, old guys can go home, right? Everybody can go home. John, you have a question? I'm just double checking. Which one? Oh, kids. Right. 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 Right.
It's going to come back for a second reading. Oh, no, I was even thinking that was going to take one. I don't know what you're talking about. It's good. I'm glad. 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 I'm glad